Right, so that's chemistry, physics, laser technologies. I want to finish off with a bit about DNA and uh, ancestry. We've been involved with two projects. This followed on from the Blood of Vikings, which we were involved with at Nottingham. But then there was a follow-up in 2003, working with scientists at the University of Leicester. Leicester is the birthplace of forensic genetics. Did anyone see that documentary last year about Sir Alec Jeffrey and the tracking down of that murderer using DNA fingerprint technology? So working with them, uh, what we wanted to do was to accurately map uh, the coastal regions up the northwest, starting with Wirral and West Lancashire uh, for part one, and then uh, part two uh, going into North Lancashire, Cumbria and North Yorkshire, and then maybe part three coming into this interesting area here, which is Dumfriesia, south of Scotland. This was complete 2008. There's a reason why this has taken such a long time, which will become <laughs> apparent in a minute. These are colleagues from Leicester, Professor Mark Jobling and Dr. Turi King. This was taken in 2010 when we were doing some sampling in Norway. Now, Turi's become very famous because she's the scientist who did the DNA work on Richard III. You know, the, another, car, another car park. This is a, a, a supermarket car park. We found that bloke under the car park. So Turi was the scientist who did the DNA work on Richard III. Anyone recognise this statue here? It's a picture taken in Haugesson in Norway. It's a very attractive looking statue, don't you think? Uh, some folks think it's the mermaid, but that's, uh, of course, in, in Copenhagen. It's uh, Marilyn Monroe. People don't realise that Marilyn Monroe, Marilyn's real name is Marilyn Mortensen, and Marilyn's father came from Haugesson in the west coast of Norway. Now, if we're probing genetics, there's a very direct way we can just look at the manifestations of genetics. Looking for Vikings, maybe we could go for the characteristics that people associate Vikings with, that sort of blonde hair and blue eyes, as manifested by this young man here, who is Stefan Edberg. Yeah, Stefan. Yeah, you can't get more Scandinavian than him. And it's true. The genes, there's more than one gene, the genes responsible for fur hair and blue eyes seem to derive from the, the Baltic Sea. For example, Gotland, in the middle of it all, there's things like 95% of the people there have fur hair and blue eyes, something very, very uh, high indeed. But the problem, problem is we don't know if they came here from the Vikings or some other time. Uh, it could have been uh, you know, a thousand years before, we don't know. Uh, another condition which appears to come from the Vikings is this uh, contracture called a Dupuytren's uh, contracture. And you get this when you get to uh, your 50s or 60s where you can't extend your fourth or fifth uh, finger. It's a tightening of elastic, elastic tissue. Anyone that got this here? No. It's a condition which is very, which is common in Scandinavia and places that were settled by the Vikings. And in, indeed, we know more about the genetics of this now. We, revise, we, we think we've, we know the chromosome, chromosome 16, where the uh, condition for this contracture is. You can get it, uh, you can get elastic tissue uh, treated. It's a simple uh, surgical operation to uh, relieve uh, this, uh, th th this condition. Or we can analyze people's DNA directly. This is the famous double helical structure which everyone knows about. They all know about Watson and Crick. What people don't know about is the discovery of the bonds which hold the DNA molecule together. That was discovered by a young PhD student at the University of Nottingham, a chap called Michael Creeth. And Mike Creeth was my supervisor as a research fellow when I was down at Bristol. And next year is the 70th anniversary of the discovery of hydrogen bonds in DNA. So having a big meeting at Nottingham to celebrate this. So DNA basically tells us what we are, but we can also use it as a probe into our 
ancestry. The test is very simple. I think a lot's been said about this. Has anyone actually done the DNA test, the mouth swab? Two people there, yeah. Do you do it as a, as a research project or do it through uh, British Ancestry or Family Tree or some of like that? National Geographic, yeah. You get supplied this little mouth swab. When this came out about 15 years ago, people, men would refuse to do it because they thought it was uh, uh, going to go to the police or you'd be cloned or something. But now it's, uh, it's very popular and you can get individual testing now for something like 100 pounds and you get these little sheets back saying where your <coughs> ancestors come from or something. And it's very simple, you just put this little uh, brush in your mouth, you rub against your, uh, your cheeks. Uh, you don't brush your teeth. Otherwise, we trace you back to a bacteria, not to a, uh, a, a Viking or whatever. And then you put the brush into a tube containing something like washing up liquid. It's called a, a SDS, which is a preservative, and you twizzle it about. You throw away the, the brush like you do with any, any toothbrush, and then it goes back to the uh, laboratory uh, for testing and analysis. And there's a Turi again, and Pila at Leicester. And then it's analysed using equipment like this, which is called a PCR machine. And then you get these DNA fingerprints, which can help us to type your chromosomes or chromosome types. So from these fingerprints here, is Mr Hyde the same as Dr Jekyll? And the answer is no. They have different fingerprints. This is not real data, by the way. There's no uh, Dr Jekyll or Mr Hyde. So we can analyse these messages from our, our ancestors, or we can analyse part of our DNA which we get from our mums down the maternal line, or we can analyse what's called Y-chromosomal DNA, which comes from our fathers only if you're men. This DNA is all mixed up. We get it all mixed up from our mums and dads. This DNA is passed along the maternal line with no change. This along the paternal line from no change. So we can analyse our paternal line or our maternal line. If we're blokes, if we're women, we can only analyse our maternal line. So take the Hardings, that's our lot. This is my wife, Anne, and these are my four sons, Tom, Rich, Matt and John. So they will have the same Y chromosome as me. Or at least I hope so. And uh, then this is our wonderful granddaughter, Annabelle. She's now five. So John presented her with a granddaughter five years ago. And this is Simone, who's Annabelle's mum. So Annabelle will not have the Y chromosome from me because she's a girl. And she won't have the mitochondrial DNA from Anne because she will get that from her own mum, which is Simone, who comes from Dresden and East Germany. That's how it operates. But the nice thing about the, the Y chromosome is we can link it also to surnames, which are also passed along the male line with little or no change. With these projects, what we've done is it's focused on men because only men pass on their surnames with no change. That's why we've, so sorry ladies, that's why we focus on men. There's no discrimination, but you should let us off that. The Y DNA, by, by the way, doesn't code for anything. It's got what's called junk DNA on it, which uh, again, women think is very appropriate for the male chromosome. But it has this wonderful signal from our past. So by choosing volunteers from men who have surnames that are in these areas prior to 1600, we could get round the huge problem of population movement into and out of the areas after the Industrial Revolution. This is especially important in the Northwest, especially around Liverpool, because of the huge growth of Liverpool as a port in the 18th century. So by using men with surnames that were exclusive or, or were in the area prior to 1600, then we could make the test rigorous. And this is the sort of result you get. This looks very beautiful, but perhaps uh, meaningless. But what we're showing here is distributions of the various male Y chromosome types or haplogroups in the particular areas. So, for example, in Norway, there's lots of this group here called R1A1, but hardly any in Ireland or 
in central Scotland, whereas in Orkneys and Shetlands, it's something sort of halfway between the two. In the northwest of England, again, you've got some signal Isle of Man and Lake District. In modern Wirral and West Lancashire, taken for the modern population with no surname criteria, you get small levels of this. But in a medieval population, that means people who have surnames that were present in these areas prior to 1700, then you get quite a spectacular result. Now that we can compare the whole distributions with each other to work out the extent of ancestry or how similar populations are to each other, or we can focus on particular markers. For example, R1A1. In Norway, 35% of the men have this type, and very few have this in Wales, Anglesey, and in central Scotland and in Ireland. And even in places like Holland and York, levels are very low. And Denmark is quite low, so quite distinct from the Norwegian. This is quite a good marker for Norse or Norwegian Vikings. You can see that in medieval West Lancashire and Wirral, there's quite a substantial, almost half the amount in Norway. This work was published in 2008, at the end of part one. You see the, the football team of authors present. This shows you how multidisciplinary this sort of research is now. We've got mixtures of scientists, geneticists, Viking experts, Judith Jesh is Professor of Viking Studies at Nottingham, Patrick Waite is Chairman of the West Lancs Heritage Association, Stephen Roberts is an expert on surnames, a whole group of people coming together. This is published in 2010 in this book form. This is the book with the error, with that fake fake coin in, by the way, so it's a collector's <laughs> item.